having uh, these uh, participants to join the session and uh, that's what's happening right now. Thank you. Welcome yeah. everyone. And let me see if uh, now we have five. Absolutely. Thank you. Have you noted? Vielen Dank. This is a big, big panel because sometimes we have uh, three panelists, you know, sometimes uh, uh, four, but that's the average. <clears throat> but this is a really a big one. So uh, we definitely will have to stick to the 20 minute time limit. So when you approach 15 minutes, I will I will um, politely remind you about the uh, passing of time and uh, then you will have uh, another five minutes and uh, before uh, the 10 minutes I will uh, make another uh, final warning that you have uh, one more minute to conclude and to, uh, to, to finish your presentation. So uh, these might uh, seem harsh rules but don't uh, panic because uh, that's uh, that's what ha what's happening at any uh, so-called adult conference as well uh, in the in the in the academic world. Uh, <clears throat> this is a very important factor in the in the uh, conferences because the the conferences are organized in such a way that uh, uh, of course the the schedule is always tight and uh, without such um, such uh, discipline we just simply could not uh, could not finish the conferences what we uh, <clears throat> what we attend uh, so in short uh, um, it's nothing personal so it's, it's so don't don't take it on you uh, I, I i tell this from experience because once uh, i uh, attended one of my first conferences uh, <clears throat> in the early 1990s and uh, uh, when this happened to me and a very big name uh, historian uh, uh, who was otherwise a nice person and uh, known as a, a nice person but uh, quite uh, seriously uh, reminded me that I have to finish my presentation and I was just not about to finish it yet uh, I, and I was shocked my god you know and he's such a big name and very nice guy and now he's threatening me uh, so I, I did panic, so that's why I'm I'm telling you uh, it's 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 nothing personal. It's nothing like that. It's 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 just some simply the rule of of such conferences. So, with this, uh, let me first um, uh, introduce one by one uh, the uh, five panelists. You know, I tell their names and um, affiliations and uh, the title of the presentations, and then. Uh, we will move to the first presentation and then the next and the next. Uh, so then we don't, won't uh, introduce the presenter again. So let me just start with this um, <clears throat> this um, uh, introduction. <clears throat> so the topic uh, is a very interesting topic, especially for uh, for the venue of this conference, um, uh, Budapest and uh, Central Europe. Uh, so the topic is East Central Europe in the Cold War. Uh, first uh, speaker will be Sabina Nakbar uh, from the Lu Ludwig Boltzmann Institute um, for Research into Consequences of War. That's the long name of the Boltzmann Institute uh, in Graz, uh, Austria, and she's a PhD candidate. Her topic will be Czechoslovak intelligence in Austria from the perspective of Austrian authorities during the early Cold War from 1948-1960. The next speaker will be Bartosz Gromko from the Cardinal Stefan uh, Wyszynski University, Warsaw, Poland, uh, a PhD candidate also. Uh, the topic will be Radio Warsawa, uh, the voice of the Italian communists from be beyond the Iron Curtain. Uh, the next speaker will be Jitka Drahotska, University of Aberdeen, uh, United Kingdom, Department of History, uh, BA program. The topic is the winter after the spring, emotions in the trans, transit, transit, transitionary uh, period uh, between the Prague Spring and the advent of normalization in Czechoslovakia through the self-immolation of Jan Pollock. Uh, then the next speaker will be uh, Karol Schwastek. I hope the pronunciation was not that bad. Uh, University of Silesia, Katowice. Uh, Poland, Silesian Freedom uh, and Solidarity Center, PhD candidate also. The topic will be for dignity, 
resistance against martial law in Poland in December 1981. And the last but not least, uh, the, the fifth speaker will be Andrei Olteanu uh, from the Babaj Boya University in Cluj, Romania, Faculty of History and Philosophy, UBB Master Program. The topic will be uh, the most favored nation misinterpreted by Western states, Ceausescu, a failed hope of relaxation. Uh, the time span is 1975-1985. Uh, so with this uh, uh, little introduction, uh, without further ado, let me just uh, give the floor to the uh, first uh, presenter, uh, <clears throat> Sabine Nagbar. So please, the floor is uh, yours and please uh, uh, unmute your microphone. Thank you very much. Um, I will share my presentation with you. Yes, please do so. Yeah. I will yeah, tell you when we can see. We can see it. Okay. No, yeah. That's fine. Yes. So just go on, please. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. Um, today, as you mentioned already, thank you for the introduction. Um, I will talk about the Czechoslovak intelligence activities in Austria from the perspective of Austrian authorities during the early Cold War. Um, in 1954, the US American Counterintelligence Corps, short CIC, stated the Czechoslovak Intelligence Service is the most, the most active of the various Eastern intelligence services represented in Austria and has conducted more known operations in Austria than have all other Eastern eye services combined. Regarding the other Eastern intelligence services in Austria, the CIC stated further on, the CIS, that means short for Czechoslovak Intelligence Service, entered upon the Austrian scene in steadily accelerating force, while the other Eastern I services gradually reduced theirs to a point where none but the Soviet pres presently constitutes a serious security problem to the U USFA, means US forces in Austria. As decided at the conference of Yalta in February 1945, Austria until 1955 was occupied by the four allied powers after World War II. As a result, the Western, the Western and Eastern blocs and their intelligence services were facing each other on Austrian territory in upcoming Cold War. Due to its uh, special geopolitical uh, position and the permeability of the Austrian side of the Iron Curtain, Eastern and Western intelligence services used Austria as a gateway for operations against each other, which continued beyond 1955 in then neutral Austria. Um, and I, I quote again, um, Austria serves not only as an arena for such activities, but also as a base from which operations against bordering and not far distant countries are conducted and further as a route through which espionage personnel pass on missions. Whilst Moscow increasingly, increasingly, increasingly relied on the intelligence services of its satellite countries neighboring Austria to enforce its interests, uh, the US and British services used Austria as an operational basis against communist regimes, especially in the GCR. Czechoslovakia was chosen as a target because it was deemed particularly important to the Soviet Union, but offered the easiest chance of success for the British. Based on, a re on research that has been conducted so far during the uh, uh, three-year project on activities of Czechoslovak intelligence services in Austria in the Central European context uh, in this period uh, of the early Cold War, um, networks, operations, and impacts. Uh, I will give insights uh, into first findings regarding the Austrian perspective on the Czechoslovak intelligence activities in Austria. As part of a research team, um, I plan to write my PhD thesis about this topic. In the course of the three-year project, we intend to answer the following questions. 
what kind of networks had the Czechoslovak intelligence uh, services installed in Austria, how did they work um, concerning structure, operations, communication, and last but not least, a very important but hard to be answered question, what impact did these activities have on political or strategic decisions? Consequently, uh, based on the example of Austria, we will draw con conclusions on the main targets of, of the Czechoslovak intelligence services in Austria, the bigger political interests or strategies behind these intelligence activities and the counter counterintelligence activities respectively of the other players, and the impact the intelligence findings of all these or uh, concerning this topic of all these services had on the course of the Cold War. Especially with regard to the questions how West oriented was neutral Austria uh, and if the Western uh, services wanted to push back communism, did the Eastern services want to strike back or did they have other interests? We still have a lot of research to do to analyze the main strategies and political interests behind single operations. On the Czechoslovak side, we face an enormous number of documents in connection with Austria with detailed um, dossiers. The common myth that the Residentura in Vienna was together with the one in Berlin, the biggest, um, has still to be proven. Based on archive materials from mainly Austrian, uh, Czech, US and British archives, we apply a complementary approach. The heart of the research project is a database uniting all the information from archival documents. Existing publication on intelligence services and their activities in Austria usually stick to one perspective. First results show, first results show that the chosen approach is very important to complete and verify uh, information and to evaluate the impact of operations especially regarding to the documents produ produced by the intelligence services. The database is serving as an analysis tool um, to get quantified findings on networks and operations. As intelligence services operational structures are based on networks, we plan to, to apply the method of uh, network analysis to reconstruct these networks starting from single players or actors. Um, now to my research focus, the, the Austrian perspective, and that means the perspective of the Austrian authorities and is, reflect, and it is reflected in the Austrian archival documentation. This per perspective on the intelligence activities had not, has not been examined um, or analyzed yet. Key sources are uh, the relevant holdings of the Austrian State Archive, especially the Ministry of the Interior, uh, especially there the Austrian State Police and the Federal Foreign Office. They have not been analyzed so far in detail, especially not regarding the topic of intelligence activities or counterintelligence respectively. And uh, in addition to that, uh, for me it's important to have complementary documents from Czech, British or US archives. Uh, it, has, it has to be considered that due to data um, protection, the access to documents of the Austrian State Police is very limited, as well as documents have been sorted out. There is quite a lot of uh, material available. The State Police documents are not freely accessible. Um, there are case files and personal files and you can look for key, for example, for keywords or special names. So it's good to have the information from from other um, documents, for example, from check from check documents. The reports um, of the general administrations for public security in the border region are as well very valuable for getting information connected to so-called border incidents, for example. Very important are as well the holdings of the political department of the Federal Foreign Office. Uh, where you can find documents connected to different countries. Quite a lot um, are available for the relevant years uh, for the GSR. And you can find, especially, for example, especially co um, 
correspondence with the from the ministry with the Austrian embassy in Prague. Regarding the Austrian perspective, first and foremost, it has to be clarified if, um, if and to what extent the Austrian authorities were aware of Czechoslovak intelligence activities in their own land, a country. Uh, the archival um, documentation fostered the impression that the Austrian authorities, they definitely noticed these activities and, and investigated, especially in the context of illegal border crossings, uh, activities against Austrian state or in case Austrian citizens were involved. Due to the relatively lenient Austrian um, le legislation on espionage, the services and their informants, they did not have to take too much of a risk. This resulted as well in very few um, or comparatively few court cases in Austria and a limited uh, course of action for Austrian, Austrian authorities. The analysis of, of this archival material and synopsis with archival documents of the foreign services involved um, intends also to answer the following questions. To what extent uh, changed the Austrian awareness of Czechoslovak intelligence services and the Austrian countermeasures after 1955? when the Austrian Czechoslovak border became more important than the inner Austrian uh, demarcation lines uh, between the occupation zones during the occupation. Period, during the occupation. Um, how was the Austrian state police's course of action concerning intelligence activities of Czechoslovak services? Or what were the relations of Austrian authorities towards Western, especially the CSC, and the Eastern services, especially the Czechoslovak services in this case, like did the services co cooperate officially or did individuals collaborate or both? Um, how West oriented was Austria despite its neutrality? Or uh, what structures and communication channels did the Austrian security apparatus have? what kind of sources for information. Dealing with the, uh, with the relevant holdings of the Austrian state archive, archives, the importance of the Austrian Czechoslovak border region as a field of operation and surveillance for the Austrian authorities became obvious. The CIC stated that at, that, at the time, at a time where from the Czechoslovak side, um, the border region or the Iron Curtain was heavily guarded and was kind of deadly. Uh, it was nevertheless, and I quote, no barrier to the standard practice of illegal crossing. For Czechoslovak intelligence officials, agents, informers, couriers, and so on. Until 1955, the Czechoslovak intelligence services used the Soviet occupation soon, soon as a secondary base of operation under the protection of Soviet authorities. So as the Austrian archival material shows, show, sh documents they show, even uh, if the Austrian police arrested individuals at the border uh, who illegally crossed it uh, with intelligence material, they had to hand them over to Soviet authorities. And just to give you an idea how they the documentation was of the border surveillance from the Austrian side on this picture. You see it, and uh, yeah, they, they draw the border regions and and um, had remarks on what you can see, like um, where there were buildings where they, the Czechoslovak um, border guard was in and so on. And then um, you can see here from the other side, the Czechoslovak uh, intelligence service who did this for the Austrian side, and it looks uh, very similar. The cooperation between the Austrian state police, in which after 1945 initially quite a lot of communist police officers served, and the Soviets in the late 1940s, is already known. For the time after 1950, 
potential cooperation has to be analyzed. Various sources are suggesting a cooperation between Austrian authorities and the CAC, so West oriented. But to what extent this cooperation was official or institutionalized or included, for example, the CIA, has to be examined. As you can see from the following uh, selected examples, the CIC got information from sources who had access to secret files uh, of the Austrian State Police. Um, I quote, um, source C014 obtained the information from sources B and C, Walter Misa and Johann Riedel. They are members of the Austrian Security Police Sicherheitsdirektion for Land Lower Austria. Some of the personalities were listed by the Austrian Security Police as alleged CIS agents on the basis of their association with illegal border crosses. So, the, as you can see, the CIC got information from Austrian security police about individuals connected to the Czechoslovak intelligence services. Uh, and it's an, also an evidence for the importance of the so-called border incidents. Sorry, you have five more minutes. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, as well, we found an, um, Austrian, an report of the Austrian state police um, report in original, for example, in the CIC holdings. And um, just to give you an idea uh, how it works, I present to you in short uh, a case study of Olga H. It's an example of intelligence work across uh, the Iron Curtain over several years in the 1950s. She was rec recruited by the intelligence service of the Czechoslovak Pohranichny Straš, so that means the border guard, um, who, has, who had its own uh, intelligence service she was recruited to deliver information about the border region, refugee camps, Austrian army, US American bases, certain individuals, etc. She was moving in this border region without any problems to a time where the Iron Curtain was, at least from the Czechoslovak side, uh, an almost unscalable barrier. Um, so she got a, even a special training and was very valuable for the for the service. And she got, yeah, she got a special training and got paid for her work even. So that's very important. Um, but also as the um, uh, as the dis dis discovered documents concerning Olga H in CIC holdings, so we found that one as well, referred to a source respectively an informant within the Austrian Ministry of or State Police. I quote, um, source furnished the information from official records and confidential investigations. And remarkable is that in the CSC holdings, you have the original documents, while in Austrian files, you have copies. Fortunately for our research, the Austrian authorities arrested Olga H in 1958. And um, you have, they did a lot of investigative work and we have the documentation so you can learn details about the investigation process about the modus operandi of Czechoslovak service as well as of the Austrian state police. Um, so um, they shed light on the flow of information between and within the services and the sources they had and the importance of the applied complementary, I, I have mentioned it, approach is visible. Mm. So we can also learn from this case that the Iron Curtain was no barrier for the Czechoslovak intelligence services even after 55, and they continued their work. Um, even uh, the even the border was shifted at the Austrian state border and not um, on the from the demarcation line to the Austrian state border of, or at the state border of the newly established Austrian state. Um, and the Austrian authorities after 55 had the possibility and will to intervene, as you can see um, in the arrestment of Olga H. Finally, I want to give you an, just an idea of the evalu evaluation of the Austrian state police of this um, case. Uh, and I will translate it, not word by word, but just to sum it up. Uh, you can, so in case of the Olga H, this shows the determination and as a consequence dangerousness of the Czechoslovak intelligence service from the Austrian point of view. Um, it was not 
the, the intelligence service of the PS, the Pohranichny Strash, was not only capable uh, um, of mil military border reconnaissance, but also to infiltrating uh, financial and security authorities and the Austrian army compromising and corrupting functionaries of these institutions and serving as a sources as sources of information. This was alarming for the Austrian authorities because the, the border guard intelligence service actually conduct only less important operations within the intelligence services controlled by the ministries of internal and foreign affairs in Prague. So they make use of the border guards for illegal border crossings and the Austrian authorities see that the need for intensification of border surveillance is even more important. To sum it up, um, the research on, on the activities of Czechoslovak intelligence services in Austria could shed light on the role of intelligence services um, they played during the, the early Cold War, their efficiency and their general impact. Also, it could be a puzzle piece within a topic of the neutral of, of the role of the neutral states in the spy game of the Cold War, especially as a field of operation, uh, for example, regarding the rise of the communist countries and the role of the neutral states. Um, we will learn about this maybe um, more in the afternoon. So thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, this looks like a very interesting uh, and challenging project, uh, touching up on two very important uh, uh, new trends in Cold War history. One is the uh, role of the neutral states, what you have just mentioned, and then the other is the, the intelligence history kind of topic, which is a very broad topic and it's, 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 it's being done. That's, that's something which is just in the making and there are there have been all kinds of uh, results already from several countries uh, of the former Soviet bloc and from uh, Western countries as well. Uh, however, uh, this is really a, a kind of very new, still a very new field of research. So uh, I think you will have a great uh, opportunity to contribute uh, significantly to, uh, to this new field. So, so congratulations. Uh, and you. with this, let's move to the uh, second presenter. And uh, let me invite uh, Bartosz Gromko uh, to uh, make his presentation right now. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, to present this, uh, this research topic uh, to you. So virtually, my name is Bartosz Gromko. And I'm a PhD candidate at the Cardinal Stefanoszynski University in Warsaw. Um, and I'm writing a PhD dissertation on the relations between the Italian Communist Party and the Polish United Workers Party. Um, can you see the presentation right now? I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Okay. Just give me one second. Okay, so one one of the uh, one of the aspects of the relations between the two, two parties is the existence of uh, of a, a certain radio station located in Warsaw that broadcasted uh, auditions to uh, majorly to, to Italy and to other Western states. Uh, why do I think this is interesting or important? Uh, well, first of all, what comes to mind is a, a certain uh, common denominator between the radio, radio Varsavia and, for example, Radio Free Europe, uh, since both of them kind of broadcasted to, uh, uh, abroad in order to counterweight the state-owned media. So I'm not comparing the two stations, but uh, First of all, um, um, I'm not comparing the two the, the two radios, of course, but this is this is something that that we note immediately, because in Italy the uh, the 
radio was only owned by the state, the state owned the monopoly uh, for media. Um, and second interesting aspect of this topic is that it hired personnel uh, among the Italians that fled Italy, so among uh, political immigrants. So that is also someone that something that uh, that is common to, to Radio Free Europe. But of course, I'm not comparing the, those two phenomena because as we will see, the political immigrants, uh, the Italian political immigrants to socialist countries, um, well, they, they not only they were persecuted by their political beliefs, because they were usually not, but they were actually involved in certain activities that were legally questionable, let's say the least. So I conducted my research in uh, several mm, archives in Europe, in, in Poland and in Italy. Of course, the, the archives of uh, both central committees of the of the two parties, uh, but also the archives of the Italian police, which was of particular importance, and as well as the archives of Polish secret uh, services. I also used uh, several documents from the Open Society Archives in Budapest. And also two or three uh, files found in, in the uh, online archives of the of the CIA. Of course, uh, the only was uh, Italian communists uh, founded their uh, radio station. It was uh, a sort of network founded uh, probably around 1950 or 91. The negotiations between the two parties were uh, held uh, previously, probably around 1949. And the major centers uh, for the, those radios were located in Prague, Berlin, Budapest, and Warsaw, also Moscow and, and Bucharest. Um, the Prague, uh, the, the biggest, the biggest branch of the radio was located in Prague because uh, there were all immediately after the Second World War there were all, almost 400 Italian political emigres uh, in Prague, so it was the, the biggest, um, uh, the, the biggest Italian community abroad in the socialist country. So as I mentioned before, the purpose was to counterweight the state-owned media in Italy, and it was very important for the for the Italian Communist Party as the um, radio provided well, propaganda support, especially during the elections. So at the beginning in Warsaw, there were around 10, 15 people uh, located. M most of them, if not all of them, uh, had to flee Italy because they were involved, as I mentioned before, in some kind of uh, subversive activities, revolutionary activities, as espionage, um, um, homicide uh, uh, attempts. At the, I'm sorry, can you still see the presentation or? Right now, I don't see the presentation. Uh, I see you. What about now? Uh, not yet. Okay. We, we, we could That's... see it until now. Yeah, but... I, I don't know what happened. Okay, it, it just stopped. Um, just try to, to restart it again. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we can see this. Beginnings. Beginnings, perfect. It's a good beginning. I don't know why it happened. <laughs> okay. And so, but some of them were involved in uh, quite innocent actions like like uh, strike actions, and yet they still had to flee uh, Italy after the Second World War. And they were all under tutelage of the Central Committee of the Polish United Workers Party. And they were officially hired by the Polish radio. So see, I will just give you two examples of, of those uh, individuals Antonio Seliti was sentenced to six years for participating in a labor strike in Sardinia in 1948. First, he escaped to Prague and uh, worked for the Czechoslovak radio station from 1949 to 1951. And then he was transferred uh, 
to, to the Polish radio. He left in Poland uh, after almost 20 years in 1968, and he was uh, either um, the only one or one of the few Italians who actually worked uh, for the radio station for the, for the entire 20 years, because most of them either quit working for the radio earlier or were substituted by the by by um, other journalists sent uh, from from Italy another one was in Chetti for Machari Nebe and during the war he was a political commissioner in the resistance and he was involved in a homicide uh, the circumstances of this uh, of this event are not clear this is what he uh, told the, the Polish secret services. And he became, in 1956, he became um, a secret collaborator for the Polish security services by the name Nuvola. He was not the only one who worked for the Polish services. There were at least three or four other collaborators. And, and they uh, either continued the, collab the collaboration with the, the secret services uh, throughout their stay in Poland, or they, in some cases, there was one case when uh, one individual, one one Italian journalist, uh, quitted this collaborate, collaboration after 1956, after the uh, invasion of Budapest. He was expelled, uh, eventually he was expelled from Poland in 1964 for the fiscal uh, evasions, because certain part of this Italian group was also, uh, while working for the radio, they were also involved in other activities, like, for example, working for um, uh, as a commercial representatives for the Italian um, companies for the, owned by the Communist Party in Italy. So he was expelled from Poland in 1964, and his his name is mentioned in the documents in the reports of Radio Free Europe, as you can see here. Uh, he was eager in the 50s. He was eager to go back to Italy to start a revolution. He was uh, preparing himself for a for an armed conflict in Italy, and um, and yeah, and this is why probably. His collaboration with the police, with the with the Polish secret services, was motivated ideologically. He was a he was a communist, uh, and um, but later on he was involved in a very capitalist activities. As I mentioned, he was a commercial representative. For some reason, he 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 was um, probably uh, the, the secret services considered him a kind of a threat. So he was expelled. And how the radio worked? Uh, the, the frequency of the radio, you can see Varsavia, Praga, Mosca. Uh, the frequency of the radio was provided via leaflets distributed among the, the federations, the local communist federation in Italy. And they were also published in the Italian journal, the, um, Journal owned by the Italian Communist Party, the Unita. So you can see here the, the um, names of the very of various radio stations: Varsavia, Praga, Mosca, Varsavia. Again, but also can, Ogin Italian. Sorry, we cannot yeah, see only the first slide, which is beginnings, and maybe you are talking about a different slide now. Ah, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm sorry. I suppose my computer is really, really slow because I cannot. What about now? Not yet. Range and popularity. Yes. Yes. This okay. is what I was talking about. Okay. okay so here you can see the list of frequencies, right? And Oggi yes. d'Italia is one one of the the biggest uh, one. It was uh, a separate uh, audition. So okay. this is not clear because the documents all sometimes confuse and refer to all of the radio stations as Oggi in Italia. Um, I, I assume it, it changed throughout the years, um, but this is not important. Uh, since the 1963 or 1964, uh, the broadcast reached also Italian immigrants in Western Germany. Uh, and 
it also it's also uh, related to the improvement of the of the of the beacons uh, located in in works in Poland and in Czechoslovakia. The the problem with the content of the radio station is that no records uh, were found, either where they were lost or destroyed. But uh, the, the Italian police uh, conducted uh, some sort of um, radio monitoring, and there are documents in the in Archivio Centrale dello Stato in, in Rome that uh, contain written uh, written material. Uh, so we can we can uh, try to recreate the, the content of the auditions. And especially in the 50s, they were really aggressive uh, against the government in Italy. They were rather unsophisticated because I have to emphasize that at the beginnings, the personnel of the radio was recruited among the political emigres. They were not professional journalists. They were, they were communists and they did their they best to, to, to do the, the journalist job, but um, all they did was actually uh, reflect the, they were copying the official uh, communist propaganda to the point that uh, in the early 50s, two or three of them resigned or were expelled because they questioned the, the journalist level of the auditions. They claimed uh, that it doesn't match the sophisticated taste of the Italian audience, especially the intelligence. And for that, they were expelled from the radio. And it basically broadcasted news, opinions, and, and very often information related to strike action in, in Italy, and also pre-electoral uh, propaganda. So it was a major support for the, for the Italian party. And gradually, the original personnel was being substituted with professional uh, journalists sent from Italy, because there's also uh, an interesting phenomena uh, related to this topic. Basically, when the first, um, when the when the when the political emigres, when the Italians uh, were able to go back to Italy, because um, either they the crimes or Whatever they were accused for was, um, uh, well, yeah, they, they could legally, they could legally uh, apply for a passport, for the Italian passport. And when they came back, they could compare the, the living standards in both blocks. So uh, in the 50s, many of them uh, went back to Italy because they, they well, the, the, the delusion, they, this, their disappointment in the socialist reality uh, grew, and they well simply decided to 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 leave. Also, they encountered a constant uh, control uh, from the Polish secret services. That was another factor uh, that made some of them well leave because simply the living in in Poland was getting uh, more and more difficult especially in the early 50s. Uh, can you see the next slide, I'm sorry? Called Bitter End. Not yet. It's still okay. range in popularity. OK, I'll just need to refresh, refresh it. Yes, maybe just try to do it. OK, what about now? Uh, not yet. It did work previously, so just try it again. Now it's okay, bitter end. Yes, exactly. Great. So, um, as I mentioned before, uh, gradually the personnel was replaced by professional journalists in the 60s, and they came to Poland uh, legally. But and and also the content of the uh, auditions changed a little bit, uh, especially uh, um, especially given the the tent process. Uh, the auditions were less anti-government; they were less aggressive, 
they were more professional, more lighthearted. There was some music, and since the the broadcast was also reaching uh, Italians in Germany, the purpose of the of the auditions was to create a link between Italians working in Germany, in Western Germany, and their families uh, in Italy, especially in Southern Italy. So there were okay. more uh, folk music, etc. Excuse me, that uh, the bitter end is approaching. So uh, five uh, okay. minutes more. Okay? Five minutes, perfect. Yes. Wonderful. Um, why the, the end was bitter? Uh, as you may know, in 1967, uh, an anti-Zionist campaign started in Poland under the Gomułka's rule, and it also strongly affected the Italian group, um, since the, the head editor, uh, a coordinator for the entire group, for the entire radio personnel, uh, Mario Cavagnaro, was actually um, controlled by the secret services. Uh, they wanted to know if he has um, Jewish origins. And they wanted to know if he supported Israel in uh, during the war in 1967. And they, they, they made a the, uh, big inquiry among uh, his colleagues, etc. So they they already felt the suffocating atmosphere in Poland, and they were actually sending uh, reports to the Central Committee of the Italian Communist Party in Italy, uh, alarming that the, the atmosphere is getting unbearable in Poland. And, but eventually, after only one year, the the, the radio stopped the broadcasting uh, because the Italian Communist Party condemned the invasion of Czechoslovakia. So there was no longer, uh, there was no point of continuing the broadcast since the, the interest of both parties uh, changed drastically. And the uh, majority of them uh, left the country, so there was no longer any personnel uh, working for the radio. Some of them stayed uh, up until the late 80s, uh, continuing their the work uh, for the for the for the Italian companies, etc. So, and one one last interesting example: uh, one of the the employees, the one that was expelled in the fifties because he uh, he opposed the, the line, the political line of the of the radio. He was actually working for the Soviet uh, in, when he was in Italy in the forties. Was working for the Soviet intelligence, and in the fifties he continued to work for the Polish secret services. But when he stopped, he actually uh, um, reached and stayed in contact. He maintained contact with the Polish dissidents, with the family of uh, Polish poet Viktor Woroszylski. So some of them, well, continued to work for the Polish secret services. Others, uh, others, well, they they reflected on their uh, early choices and they they, um, well, they they in contact with the, with the dissident movement. So that would be all, I believe. Thank you very much again. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this is another uh, uh, new type of topic. Of course, uh, the, the role of radios has been uh, a big topic since um, since um, yeah, the, from the 1990s, and, but it's especially it's focusing on the other side. Radio Free Europe, Voice of America, Radio Liberty, uh, whatever uh, the radios uh, uh, were <clears throat> sponsored and uh, financed on the American side uh, towards the Eastern Bloc, you know. But this is uh, the kind of opposite of of that, and and in this field, uh, much less research has been done uh, so far. So again, uh, my advice is uh, very similar uh, to you as well. What we I have. Uh, told to Sabina that uh, uh, go on uh, and uh, and uh, it, it, it's a big challenge, uh, uh, but it's a very good topic. And it's a, it's a relatively new topic also, and it has a lot of potential uh, because uh, the, the the field is uh, more or less unexplored or or much less explored than than fields on the other side. So uh, definitely this this has a lot of potential to make uh, comparisons uh, or to try to find. Uh, uh, find more sources um, 
uh, either in the Open Society Archive or in archives in, uh, in Italy uh, or in Poland. Uh, so um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a work in progress, I understand, absolutely. So uh, I just want to encourage you that, that uh, this is really worth uh, doing and exploring because this is a, a very marketable topic uh, in a Western perspective as well, not just in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, but because in this particular case, it's uh, it's about Italy as well. So this is this is uh, uh, something which is uh, mar will be marketable not only in Italy but in in a general sense uh, on the uh, on the Western market as well. Okay. So with this, thank you again, and then uh, let's uh, move to the next presenter, Yitka uh, Drahotska, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just quickly try the PowerPoint. Can you see the slides now? Yes, the winter after the spring. Yes. Um, all right. Um, thank you so much for, for the kind introduction. Uh, it is absolutely an honor to be a part of this conference and I'm sorry. And it's been a really inspiring experience so far. Uh, my today's paper, which is a part of um, research that I recently started, is going to focus on Czechoslovakia in late 1960s and the role of emotions in historical research. Um, great. In January 1969, a 20-year-old university student, Jan Palach, set himself on fire in Prague city centre. At the scene of incident, Palach left a letter meant for public, uh, public distribution signed as Torch No. 1. Um, according to his words, and I quote, since our nations have found themselves on the edge of hopelessness and resignation, I had decided for this way of protest. Almost six months after half a million Warsaw Pact soldiers invaded Czechoslovakia to suppress the widely celebrated reforms of the Socialist Democratic Prague Spring, his self-immolation was meant to wake up Czechoslovaks to oppose the regressive politics of so-called normalization, which started to take root in the country after Soviets reclaimed their, domina their domination in the domestic politics. For a brief moment, Palak's act had epitomized the shared feelings of frustration and powerlessness originating in the unstable political atmosphere, and his funeral procession gathered hundreds of thousands of silent mourners into the streets of the metropole. However, despite the tragedy, normalization continued to ascend without being widely ch challenged by the public. How and why did the same national movement that once eagerly defended the gained freedoms uh, from the occupation forces suddenly sink after several months into emotional illness and powerlessness amidst the resurrection of authoritarian uh, politics matching the Soviet model? In terms of historical research, the time between the Prague Spring and normalization has often led historians to employ a bird eye perspective in the social political analysis. However, occasions such as Palak's funeral demonstrate that even the new politics of normalization did not work in a vacuum or a top-down um, fashion. Rather, they were a process of active negotiation between the Czechoslovak Communist Party and the people as a result of omnipresent frustration, fear and despair. Using emotions as a historical lens present a new perspective on a range of traditional sources such as newspaper articles or political statements but it also brings new and omitted sort of materials such as photographs or slogans, which uncover the mechanisms of fostering a sense of community via symbolism, rituals or expressions of nostalgia in people's acts of commemoration. So this paper surveys the methodological benefits of the history of emotions and how it can uh, benefit the traditional scholarship of the predominant political and social history. In my presentation, I will briefly survey the approaches uh, that historians of emotions uh, use today. Then I will present a short context about Jan Palak's death and why the sources from the emotionally heightened time can help us to contextualize the general feeling of this transitional period between 1968 and 1969. In the next session, I will apply some of these methods to explore the emotional experience uh, on, the on the Communist Party the students and the public in general. And, and last, I will just conclude my findings with a short comment on how we can utilize emotional lens in uh, historical writing in general. 
Regardless of time and place, emotions are something intrinsically personal, yet they guide us in decision making and facilitate understanding of our surrounding. Hence, despite their personal nature, they're inseparable element of human experience. Such notion has been captured in a 1941 essay of the French historian Lucien Favre, who proclaimed that without historicizing emotions, and I quote, there could be no real history possible, end of quote. Favre identifies emotions as not mere automatic reactions, but something contagious, something that can be that can become a sort of institution and with its own ceremonies that capture or even can arouse emotions. His scholarship has been recognized as one of the origins of tracing feelings in history in a scholarly manner. However, the Western discourse on the role of emotions in people's life had been present almost since Aristotle. Throughout European hi history, uh, emotions has been uh, discussed by politicians, philosophers, artists, and from the 19th century also by psychologists, anthropologists, and neuroscientists. Emotions have been seen as something to be dealt with when working in politics, something to tame, something bodily, mechanical, divided from the mind. Yet everyone is striving to answer that one question. What is an emotion? Most of the scholars have derived their findings from empirical based studies of human biology and culture while seeking the definition. However, historians who essentially cannot empirically assess the subject of their research have adopted specific conceptions of finding and defining emotions. So rather than searching for real emotions, historians have reoriented themselves towards studying emotional imprints in the past cultures and social structures. Scholars have widely acknowledged the issue of lacking a unified definition of emotion. However, the multidirectional search for understanding past emotions has only added to the colorful palette of methodological approaches. The major, uh, the major shift for historians came in 1980s with Peter and Carol Stearns, who coined the term emotional, emotionology. This approach uh, identifies emotions as something, um, as attitudes or standards that a society maintains towards basic emotions and their appropriate expression. In other words, emotions are universal. Everyone has and feels the same emotions, but their expression changes regardless uh, uh, in respect of the context. Emotional uh, G prompt an exploration of sources that have been neglected, like images, literature, music, or even household items, jokes, or love letters. Hence, as one of the leading historians, Robert Bodice argues, emotions can only enrich studies that would otherwise be, for instance, and I quote, merely a socioeconomic story, end of quote. Hence, what kind of story can we tell while using a palette self immolation as a historical case study? When 20 year old students succumbed to severe burns in mid January 1969, it was only a year after the rise of Alexander Dubček into the leadership of the Czechoslovak Communist Party. This marked the beginning of the Prague Spring, a series of liberal reforms, including uh, greater freedom of travel, press for individuals, economy, and limitation on the secret police. As A.J. Stone puts it, the first half of 1968 hence brought, and I quote, a renaissance of expression among public and intelligentsia. However, for Moscow, the situation on the western border of the Eastern Bloc became concerning. And without consent of the Czechoslovak government, all reformative steps were unexpectedly halted in morning of August 21st, when soldiers of the Warsaw Pact crossed the borders. The state representatives were forcibly taken to Kremlin to formally denounce the ref uh, reforms, while thousands of Czechoslovaks initiated nonviolent protests all around the country. Leading newspapers and journals have been once again censored, and the Soviet published propagandistic journal Spravy, badly imitating Czechoslovak news, became widely distributed. As Dubček and other representatives returned to Prague, the process of normalization started almost immediately. Forced, uh, fostered after the violent uh, 1956 intervention in Hungary, Normalization re-entered the Soviet vocabulary in September 1968 as a euphemism for uh, recalibration, oh geez, as I quote, recalibration uh, of the local system to match the norm representing uh, the Soviet model, end of quote. Brezhnev decided to keep Dubček in, uh, in elite. However, the gap between the people, the government and the Soviets became wider and wider. Mass protests occurred on public anniversaries, 
Yet the reformative pre-August days progressively faded away under the observant eyes of countless Warsaw-packed soldiers occupying the country. On January, 19, uh, on January uh, 16, 19, 1969, likely inspired by the self-immolation tradition of Buddhist monks who uh, protested the government and occupation forces in Vietnam, Palak sent himself on fire at the, busy, at the top of the busy Wenceslau Square in the central Prague. His act did not protest against the occupation per se, rather he demanded the immediate abolition of censorship and distribution of spravi. Eventually, saved by a bystander, he was transported to a nearby hospital where he succumbed his injuries three days later. Palak's act shook the status quo of the widespread social change presented by the normalization. Firstly, uninformed, the public slowly uh, started getting information about this act. In the upcoming days, the Communist Party daily was filled with statements of representatives of different unions and groups, and his funeral attracted half a million of people into the streets. Although Palak's death did not wake up the nation and no major challenge of the regime came until 1970s, Kremlin perceived the public disobedience as a sufficient reason to replace the previous du uh, leader, Dubček, with Gustav Husak, a conservative normalizer in March 1969. As Husak's policy and ideology of normalization became uh, non-negotiable, uh, the public powerlessness um, resulted in individualism and fatalism. By the end of the year, thousands of Czechoslovaks went into exile. Woke critics uh, were removed from their positions and no major uh, challenge came until late 1970s. Um, and if fatalism and almost Orwellian double think, double speak became the norm uh, after August 1968 and notably in 1969, why did Palak's act attract so many people? As K. Um, Andreolo notes, and I quote, for the thousands of people who had been shaken not knowing why, the funeral spelled out the meaning of the shudder and translated into communal action in which everybody could perform a gesture that mattered. A gesture symbolizing not only compassion, but also the, the disillusionment with the, uh, between the public and the Communist Party. As I mentioned before, Brezhnev decided to leave Dubček and his cabinet in power despite the occupation. Such move created a rather paradoxical situation, as it was the same governmental body that first abolished censorship and introduced democratic reforms in 1968, that now suddenly promoted obedience and peace when these freedoms had been stripped away. The fear of possible military action from the Soviet side echoed in numerous political speeches broadcasted even before Palak's act. Members of the Central Committee of the Communist Party said, and I quote, the key is our close connection to the Soviet Union, without which, and I ask everyone for understanding, our socialist republic cannot survive in this divided world. Our society cannot permanently live in a state of tension and on the edge of political crisis during which trivial reasons may lead to a tragic conflict, end of quote. You can see that, for example, Palak's act was perceived as one of these trivial reasons. None of the political representatives were present at Palak's funeral. Yet, as the contemporary newspaper announced, numerous police units were deployed and ready to suppress any signs of unrest. This gap between the politicians and the people became wider and wider, allowing the normalization to advance and amid uh, the climate of fear and surrender. Yet, fear did not only come from the presence of the Warsaw Pact soldiers. Palak's signature torch number one indicated that others might follow his example. Newspapers and the radio decided, uh, dedicated time to psychiatrists who uncovered the taboo of suicides and the necessary prevention. Letters written by mothers and union represent, representing women called for peace and renowned critics of the normalization openly begged young people to fight for their ideals by choosing everything but the self-destructive means. Despite attempts to hide the incident in scarce reports, unfortunately, the so-called Black Chronicle reported on several other youths committing or attempting suicide by self-immolation in the early 1969. However, despite the fear, the student population assumed responsibility for the funeral procession. Being born into solely communist society, the new generation entered the age of developing its political consciousness in, 19, uh, in the late 1960s. 
With the halt of reforms in 1968, their eagerness to engage with the situation in January 1969 became the drive for many events and commemorative acts, such as hunger strikes or morning parades. With the innocence of the protected, students' efforts brought symbolism and performative displays uh, of emotions. For instance, people drew a parallel between the 15th century religious reformist Jan Hus and Jan Palach as both died in flames for the truth and the nation. This connection was kept visible by positioning Palach's remains next to Hus, um, as a statue at the Prague's Childish University and by exhibiting such depictions at the protest gatherings as well, as you can see on the picture on the right. Stereotypically, rage and anger serves as a source for protest. However, oh, sorry. However, uh, the events that transpired after Palak's death suggested that uh, emotions associated with sadness and grief offer alternative vectors for dissent. The funeral procession allowed individuals to embody a sort of superior individuality, which its sense of uniformity, monumentality, collectiveness and gestures associated with compassion allow people to express the overall um, mood of the of the society. Excuse me, you have five more minutes now. Thank you. Of course, the study has limits uh, in its scope, but a further research utilizing various theories of the history of emotions might help scholars to investigate this topic further. For instance, the student activity uh, challenged, as a historian Reddy would conceptualize, um, the accepted emotional regime. In other words, what emotions and their respective expression were deemed as acceptable in this period. Similar to Reddy's emotional uh, regimes, historians can also analyze collective emotional answer in terms of so-called emotional communities. As each society has, uh, can have multiple emotional communities, historians of emotions can then um, assess different, not only different communities, but also the power relations between them. Such methodology could uh, help us to, for example, explore uh, how people outside Prague uh, saw this whole uh, event or how Slovaks were involved in this event, young workers or international community. Hence, to conclude, um, as a transitional period in Czechoslovakia between 1968 and 1969 shows, emotions often uh, became both actors of change and the response to politics, uh, politics and social events. The individual capitulation, creation of a private public identities and conditional tolerance of the communist ideology from the late 1960s onwards until 1989 was a product of separation between the people and the state leadership. The study of emotions wields the potential to enrich the current socio-political and event-driven historiography of the Central Eastern European historical affairs. And furthermore, it offers scholars new ways of bringing back human agency into narratives, including high politics. But on a slightly different note, studying or at least paying attention to the past emotions also reflects how historians write history. History of emotions can support the writing process and eventually our understanding and imagination of the past. In other words, coming back to the personal nature of emotions, Including feelings, into, uh, including feelings into analysis may enable us to capture the study period in more accurate and accessible ways for the readers and for ourselves as well. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I think this was also a very uh, thoughtful and very uh, exciting topic, very interesting. And um, <clears throat> just like the other two, topics um, <clears throat> were a kind of new type of, um, of a field of research. Uh, <clears throat> in that sense, we can say uh, the, the topic of uh, or, or the field of uh, role of emotions uh, is, is, is even more striking um, as, as a kind of new topic, new field, new direction, especially combined with Cold War history. Uh, of course, like role of emotions could be uh, studied throughout history uh, from ancient times uh, up until today. Uh, but when we combine these two in the framework of the Cold War, then this is something really very, very interesting or it might be a, a very uh, challenging uh, project. So again, uh, I'm, I'm encouraging you to uh, look into this. Maybe in the debate section, uh, a Q&A, uh, if I have more time, uh, I will add some other comments as well, uh, uh, suggestions and so on. But But for the time being, um, uh, let me just congratulate you to you.
uh, or, or on this um, presentation. And then let's move uh, to the next speaker, uh, Carol Swastek. Please tell me whether this pronunciation is good or not, because I'm not sure this is the right one. So please just let us know how we should uh, pronounce your name properly. Okay, it's pretty good, but uh, best is Hvastek. Hvastek. Uh, yes, Thanks. I know it's uh, difficult. Yeah. Okay, yes. My so, name uh, is also uh, difficult in, in English. Uh, <laughs> I, I get letters even today after 30 years uh, uh, of, uh, of correspondence like uh, Chaba spelled like C Z Z, not an S, but Z and A B A, uh, <clears throat> which which is a Hungarian ancient uh, like Christian name. So uh, um, I, I know the problem. Uh, so uh, Kwastek, thank you very much. So Carol Kwastek, please, the floor is yours. OK, I'll try to share with you my presentation. Um, yes, I think can, everything you is can working. see this. Yeah. Yes, you can okay. see it. Um, uh, it's, it's really nice to be here. Uh, thank you for accepting my uh, article. Um, I'm working um, on the project about the democratic opposition in Poland in 1980s. Um, but now I want to talk about the resistance against martial law in Poland. Uh, in the first month, uh, December 1981. Um, the 16 months of solidarity trade union put the Polish United Workers' Party in a very difficult uh, position. Within a few weeks, uh, nearly 10 million people joined the new union and the society's demands uh, grew steadily uh, while the power of the Polish Communist Party was shrinking. Um, when the Solidarity Carnival was underway, the party was taken over by the military. General Wojciech Jaruzelski came to power. To restore control over the state, the new government decided to use force. The martial law plan, which had been secretly prepared for many months, was introduced on the night of December from the 12th to the 15th of December, 90. 81. Uh, the introduction of martial law was primarily uh, intended to uh, scare the public, the society. General Wojciech Jaruzelski was not sure if the operation would be uh, successful. Uh, therefore, a few weeks before the introduction of the uh, martial law, General Wojciech Jaruzelski wanted to obtain assurances from the Soviet leadership for um, possible aid, uh, which he did not receive. On the night of December uh, 8, General Jaruzelski directly demanded military assistance from Marshal Kulikov. And uh, Jaruzelski said, strikes are the best option for us. The workers will remain in place. Uh, it will be worse if they leave workplaces and start devastating committees party um, organize street demonstrations, etc. If this were to involve the whole country, it is you, it means the USSR, uh, who will have uh, who will have to help us. We can't handle it alone. End of quote. Uh, during the meeting of the political bureau of the CPSU Central Committee on December 10th, 1981, Mikhail Suslov said. So I think we are all in agreement here that there can be no question of introducing troops in any case. However, at night, uh, December 12th, Polish tank hits the streets. Telephone communication was uh, interrupted and full control of radio and television was taken. Meanwhile, in the first uh, few uh, hours, the militia and the secret police called the Służba Bezpieczeństwa, I mean, secret uh, security service, interned almost all solidarity leaders. Uh, under the decree of uh, martial law, uh, military courts could even issue a death sentence for resistance. In the morning, a uh, speech by General Wojciech Jaruzelski regarding the introduction of Martial law was broadcast 
uh, in the uh, media. The workers decided to use the methods that uh, had been effective so far. The strike due to surprise and intimidation by the authorities, the protests uh, did not take on a mass character. Um, as I said, uh, in solidarity, it was around uh, 10 million people, but the strikes uh, in December 1981 was undertaken by around uh, 46,000 solidarity activists, mainly from the Upper Silesia uh, region. Workers protested only inside their workplaces. Uh, downtime in uh, mines uh, could have resulted in a reduction in the output of the main export product of the Polish People's Republic, coal. Most of all, uh, the coal resources in power plants uh, in December 1981 were very limited. Um, therefore, uh, the uh, response from the authorities was hard. Um, trade unionists were intimidated by the penal consequences, and if that was to not avail, the police uh, entered the workplaces and pacified all those who resisted. The bloodiest clash took place in the Wujek mine in Katowice, the 16th, 90. Uh, 81. Militia and military forces consisted of uh, 1,470 militiamen, 760 soldiers, 22 tanks, and 44 infantry support vehicles. These uh, units were supported by helicopters, uh, water cannons, and tear gas uh, launchers. The strikers were well prepared for the attack having been warned about the pacification of the other workplaces, workers created barricades and uh, improvised uh, weapons. The attack started at 11 o'clock. Militia entered the mine area three times. Each time it was uh, pushed out by the strikers. Uh, then the military commanders decided to use live ammunition and as a result of the shelling, 23 miners were injured and nine more died. And the death of the miners became a symbol of repression taken by the authorities uh, in the evening of December 16th, at the same day. The workers of the Vujek mine put the wooden cross uh, in the place where the tank destroyed the fence. Despite repression, people flocked around this place, lighting candles and lying uh, flowers. Um, after the pacification of the Vujek mine, most of the strikers in other workplaces ended their protest. Um, but the longest strike on the surface took place in Steelworks Katowice, located in Dombrowa Gurnica. Steelworks Katowice was the flagship communist's uh, investment in the 1970s and the strikers stayed in the huge area of the steelworks from 13th to 23rd December. The strikers even published leaflets and opposition new papers on the premises of the steelworks. The first attempt to pacify the steelworks um, took place on December 14th, but due to the size of the plant, the units were uh, withdrawn after several dozen minutes, um, but the several dozen people were arrested. Um, but the strike committee and the, the printing house moved on time to another safe place. Uh, upon um, the learning of the pacification of the Vujek mine, the strikers uh, began arming themselves with improvised weapon, um, but the militia and military forces surrounded the steelworks, withholding food uh, supplies. The attack uh, with over 200 uh, tanks, water cannons and uh, helicopters started on December 20th. Um, the longest strike was taken underground 
miners from the two neighboring mines um, called Zemovit and Piast. At the beginning of the strike, decided to move the protest underground. More than 2,000 people joined the strike in each of the two mines. For logistical reasons, the authorities did not send the militia underground. After the clash at the Vujek mine, it was decided to block uh, the few still striking workplaces like Piast and Zemovit. Miners from the Piast mine left uh, to the surface on December 28, 1981. Uh, strike leaders were arrested and the military courts adjudicate several years in prison for them. Uh, at the end of December 1981, the open resistance to the imposition of martial law ended. Um, with the introduction of martial law, and Polish society awakened the traditions of the resistance against the authorities cultivated since the end of the 18th century. Um, already on the night from 12th to, to 13th uh, December, in place of the former leaders of Solidarity, new conspirational structures were created, often operating on the basis of a triple system taken from the tradition of the underground army operating in Poland during the Second World War, the so-called uh, Home Army. For example, this was the case with the doctors from Gliwice uh, city who, when they heard about the first internet uh, activities of Solidarity, took the rest of the activities uh, of Solidarity to an agreed place in an ambulance from an um, emergency service uh, on a signal. Uh, after two weeks with this group, uh, started to collaborate um, the future Prime Minister of Poland and the President of the European Parliament, Jerzy Buzek. Uh, in the first days of martial law, leaflets and the uh, underground press began to appear on the streets of Polish uh, cities. In December 1981, the conspirational structures were chaotic, but by the beginning of 1982, Many serious organizations were established and some of them equipped um, with their own underground printing houses. Uh, as I said, uh, the martial law was uh, introduced to scare the society. Um, the highest martial law sentence was awarded to uh, Ewa Kubasiewicz from Gdańsk uh, for distributing a leaflet calling for active resistance against the martial law. Uh, in February 1982, she was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment by the naval court in Gdynia. She was released, like the most of those sentenced during the martial law, under the amnesty in mid-1983. Um, direct resistance to uh, martial law ended after a uh, uh, few uh, days. Um, most of the strikes ended at the December 16th to 17th uh, as a result of the pacification and the news about the victims at the Vujek mine. The riots did not take place, and so the best op option for the General Jaruzelski came true. Um, it was a huge success for the authors of the martial law, but at the same time, the martial law unleashed the, uh, an underground conspiracy focused on uh, many years of struggle uh, with the authorities. And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. So this was also a very uh, interesting um, insight uh, in the in the aftermath of the martial law, which is uh, of course a well-known story uh, as far as the martial law is concerned. However, the presentation what you have just made uh, uh, let us um, uh, have an insight into the 
into the details uh, of the social resistance and the resistance by solidarity and other people um, in Poland uh, against martial law. So I think this is again a kind of a, a new opportunity to to combine uh, Cold War history, communist history, and uh, and social history. Uh, so that's that's again a very interesting um, you know new uh, trend and direction uh, to uh, develop. Uh, all this into into some kind of a new uh, uh, interpretation uh, of uh, of what uh, what uh, uh, certain historic moments uh, and events uh, did mean uh, for the society, what kind of impacts it had on society, and of course uh, in in this sense that was a very interesting. Uh, uh, presentation uh, about that kind of insight uh, and and that kind of impact what what solidarity movement and the martial law the introduction of martial law uh, actually uh, triggered uh, of course again here in the q and a section i can uh, have some more comments as well but uh, uh, with this let's uh, just uh, uh, turn to the last presenter last but not least as always uh, Andrei Olteanu from um, uh, Romania, so the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, hello everyone and thank you for the opportunity. I will share uh, my uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, so uh, today I uh, will present uh, 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 the most favorite nation and how uh, was uh, misinterpreted by Western state, the case of Ceausescu, Ceausescu, Ceausescu a failed hope of relaxation <coughs> from 1975 to 1985. I uh, choose to present this topic because uh, after the courses and books uh, I read, I understood uh, uh, a need to analyze how communist Romania was truly perceived uh, by the rest of the country after the Prague Spring. Thus, uh, I was intrigued by how personalities like Margaret Thatcher, who testified uh, about the meeting with uh, Elena Ceausescu, wife of uh, Nikolai Ceausescu, that uh, she could barely distinguish a polymer from a polygon, because uh, he, she had uh, a lot of PhD in uh, chemistry. Uh, they uh, raised a uh, uh, huge interest uh, in how, why they uh, raised a huge interest uh, in uh, the leaders uh, from Bucharest. Um, I will create a context of Romania during the period uh, when uh, Gheorghe Gheorghiu Dej was in power to understand the uh, uh, Nicolae Ceausescu mode of action, uh, then analyze the main foreign policy events in which uh, Nicolae Ceausescu stood out. Um, Two very good uh, synthesis come from uh, Professor Deletant and uh, Dismanenu regarding uh, Romanian communism and uh, regarding the works uh, and uh, deeper, more accented uh, problems. Who have, uh, we have the articles from Elena Dragomir or Cesar Stancho in Cold War History from Blue Edge and LSA Ideas. In order to achieve uh, what they said and what uh, to do, I will consider in my analysis memoirs of the main people at the top of the party volumes of diplomatic documents relevant in the chronological period, documents from the archives of diplomatic archives of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the CIA archive crest, the, uh, to present the vision uh, that United States uh, of disposal, uh, summaries of political activities, newsletter analysis and report, but also uh, press articles from uh, both Scantea, the uh, newspaper of uh, the Communist uh, Romanian Party and the New York Times and other newspapers. Um, the destalinization and throwing the follow in uh, most Soviet bloc country as a result of Khrushchev reports also resonated in Romania. Towards the end of October 1956, protests of workers and students broke out in many cities in the country, including Bucharest, and Cluj, Yash, and Timisoara. In Bucharest, there was uh, there were protests of the workers from uh, uh, Grivica, 
uh, interest rate that is the same economic units in which uh, in 1932 Georgi Georgiades himself organized protest strikes. However, the most uh, stormy events were in Banat and in the capital of the region, Timisoara, where the rebellious uh, students uh, who initially demonstrate only against poor quality food in um, campus and uh, against uh, aeronet curricula in their opinion uh, radicalized the demands in short time. Um, however, the social ferment in Romania did not take on uh, such radical forms as similar phenomena in uh, Hungary or even in Poland. So uh, after a, a few weeks, uh, the spirit calmed down. Gheorghe Udej knew very well the risk associated with uh, uh, liberalization of the system take too far and maybe uh, that, uh, that uh, is why he actually uh, participated in uh, shifting the roots uh, uh, in uh, Hungary. Hungary. Uh, next to him, uh, Soviet authorities acting on the coordinate of the action uh, was uh, Emil Bonaraj, who joined great, uh, greater tasks from Soviet authorities. Romanians provide uh, logistical assistance and support from intelligence services. Member uh, of the former Hungarian leadership were transferred to, to Znagov, where they were taken into security custody. In April 1957, Imre Nogi was taken back to Hungary. Uh, and uh, in uh, June 1958, uh, he was uh, killed. International uh, repressal have not stopped being so late that after less than a year since joining the EU, Western uh, diplomats sounded the alarm about uh, the way Romania was subordinating, subordinating to Moscow. Even before the outbreak of the crisis in Hungary, the idea of withdrawing Soviet troops from Romania appeared. In 1955, following the Geneva Conference, the Soviets promised to reduce the Soviet military presence in Romania by one-fifth uh, and uh, quite easily props, proposed uh, dissolution to the Romanian authorities. The events in Hungary and the uh, destabilization they broke, provoked uh, had the effect, effect of uh, postponing negotiations on the withdrawal of troops, but in April 1958, Khrushchev made it clear that the stationing of the Soviet uh, army in Romania would soon be a thing of the past. Uh, behind the irony of uh, this uh, title, is an explanation. Dej distinguished between the Soviet and US models. By choosing the first option, Dej uh, put his party and his country on a path of autonomy from Moscow, rejecting the idea of a uh, breadbasket um, within a Council of Mutual Economical Assistance. The reference to the May-June action on the rapprochement uh, with China, trying to gain uh, China support for the idea and the neglect of meeting between Eastern European leaders, uh, left Khrushchev in doubt about the direction he was taking. Romania, in viewing the removal from the, uh, the Soviet Union, Denis de la Tan says that the closure of the Maxim Gorky Institute in Bucharest, the elimination of Russian uh, as a compulsory subject in school and the replacement of Russian street uh, names in the public buildings with Romanian's name are signs uh, are signs denouncing greater autonomy from Moscow in the spring of 1963. Kennedy in uh, June 1963 speech uh, in West Berlin refer referred to Romania as an economic and political dissident within the Soviet bloc. This statement can be interpre interpreted as a response to Romania's position on a possible military confrontation in view of the missile crisis in Cuba. With uh, Dej death, Romania through its new leader in its person, Nicolae Ceausescu, will have a more pronounced direction on its own path of the development. February 1965 come with a synthesis from CIA showing that uh, Romania has formally declared its independence and acted in accordance with the declaration. It has initiated serious contact with other major states, reject pressure from dominant neighbor or on several occasions and adopt an internal program in line with the nation interest. Uh, I forgot to say that uh, this is a code. In July 1965, on the occasion of the 9th Congress of the 
Pecher, eh? Romanian Communist Party. A journalist from the New York Times wondered if Romania was still a satellite state of the Soviets. The rise and fall of foreign affairs or of uh, uh, foreign policy. The Six Day War represented a new opportunity for Romania to assert its independence of decision from Moscow. Bilateral relations and Romania's role in the matter were highlighted uh, on uh, a high level meeting attended by Gergi Maurer and Cornelio Monesco, who meet with Secretary of State Ian Rask on June uh, 1967 uh, and President Johnson uh, in uh, a later month discussing Romanian's involvement in the Middle East issue as well as uh, Manescu can candidacy for the president of the uh, 22 session of the UN General Assembly, which eventually uh, much materialized uh, with the support of the United States, favorable to reaffirm its decision in independence from Moscow. So the following Mircea Malica speech from the UN uh, Ristram refer uh, referring to Romania position on a major international issue, but without uh, mentioning the event in Czechoslovakia, Nikolai Ceausescu's speech take place, which uh, strengthened the conviction of Western toward the vast facing pers perspective of Romania. Uh, the visit of uh, to Bucharest of, uh, was the last stop of a long tour that includes several Asia countries. Nixon uh, saw uh, Apollo 11 landing in the Pacific on July uh, 24, uh, then visited the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, India and Pakistan. He stopped in Romania at the invitation of Nikolai Ceausescu. In Romania, the visit was announced on July 4 when the US interim uh, commissioner in uh, Bucharest participating in a talk show on Independence Day TV. Uh, given that Washington uh, did not uh, recognize the Beijing regime, it uh, needed an intermediary and Romania suited this role. It was the gateway to China. This was one of the problems of the US foreign policy and Ceausescu was considered fit to play a role in solving it. Another point of discussion was the situation in Vietnam, considering that uh, the uh, White House leader would uh, say some confidential things about Vietnam that Ceausescu would send to Hanoi. With the uh, tour uh, of the communist countries in Asia, uh, when uh, he returned uh, to the country in 1971, Ceausescu announced his uh, thesis in July, thus starting the so-called Cultural Revolution, in, in which uh, the uh, emphasis on the cult of the leader was manifested. Relation between China with uh, sorry, uh, uh, relation between Romania and USA have uh, grown uh, steadily uh, so that in uh, 1972, Mara Monescu, president of the Economic Council, pay a visit to the United States where he will uh, be received by Nixon to discuss how uh, to obtain the most favored uh, nation clause and uh, will have in July placed the official visit to Romania from of the Secretary of the U.S. State Department, William Rogers. The year 1973 is uh, defined uh, with an official visit to the USA of uh, the Ceausescu couple. Following the discussion, the joint declaration, the joint declaration on economic, industrial and uh, technical cooperation between the two countries SEM are signed. After long negotiation in uh, 1975, Romania managed to receive again after the sign of, in Bucharest of uh, the agreement on uh, uh, relation between Romania and the USA, by which Romania received the most favorite clause, which is uh, fulfilled in the mandate of uh, uh, President Gerald Ford, who will undertake an official visit to Romania at the beginning of August. Uh, at least three significant international events closed, caused gradual decline of the Ceausescu regime and ultimately international isolation and implicitly its collapse. I do, uh, I do not emphasize here inter internal realities such as the serious deterioration of uh, Romania's living conditions since the end of the 70s. The systematization program, the omnipresence uh, and the omnipotence of political police control over privacy. The first event, Helsinki 
uh, final act with uh, its basket concerning human rights. Is was a, a major role on uh, Ceausescu's stability. In principle, the international community could uh, supervise the respect of the human rights in communist countries from Europe and uh, exert pressures on Ceausescu regime. In uh, 1978, however, a second major event took place. The General Ion Mihai Pacepa left Romania for the United States State of America. This act of treachery in favor of the Romanian of uh, American imperialists affected uh, Nicolae Ceausescu and uh, unsettled a lot of Romanian security. Arrived later on uh, the book of uh, Mihai Pacepa, Red Horizon, arrived uh, later on uh, President uh, Ronald Reagan desk. Uh, Ronald Reagan uh, said uh, about uh, this book that this will be uh, my Bible. Uh, the authorities from Bucharest were um, op optimistic after the Republican Reagan won the president presidential election in November 1980 because they were convinced that Republica Republicans love Romania since uh, Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford, Gerald Ford had uh, visited uh, Ceausescu. Excuse me, you have five more minutes now. Yes, I will uh, talk about state visit of Ceausescu a couple um, to Great Britain. The king uh, takes the queen. This is how John Sweeney swimmed uh, up his vision for the state visit of Romania President Nicolae Ceausescu to Britain in June 1978, an event that marked the culmination of what the Times called Britain's political romance with Romania. Um, at the beginning of the decade, the books of British writers praised uh, praise the Ceausescu and Romania often received favorable co coverage in the British press. It was uh, seen uh, at host, uh, host uh, universally as a country that, uh, although it internally uh, rigidly communist, pursued an independence foreign policy and, and uh, it was consequently, consequently uh, torn in the flesh of the Soviet Union. He wanted to industrialize, industrialize and expand his economic ties with the West to do so. Apologize, uh, apologists for British politics uh, would uh, argue that uh, therefore it was both politically and economically beneficial to support Ceausescu. Politically, it would uh, weaken, weaken uh, Moscow control over the Eastern Bloc and economically benefit British industry. Indeed, the two were linked. The most economic ties Ceausescu had with the West, the stronger his political independence from Moscow. Uh, the 1984 Summer Olympics in uh, Los Angeles are the last act of foreign policy victory that Nikolai Ceausescu achieved. Following the Soviet Union intervention in Afghanistan to establish a communist regime, several Western countries, including the USA, decided to boycott the 1980 Moscow Olympics. After four years, the competition um, was held in Los Angeles, which gave the communist countries the change to boycott the games. But there um, were a few exceptions, including Romania, which following a competition rank uh, second with uh, 53 medals of each 20 goals. As a conclusion, the break of the Romanian-American bilateral relation in 1988 are the result first of all of Romanians' unilateral renunciations of the most favored nation clause in the trade relation with the USA, simultaneously with Bucharest adoption of international position without uh, any benefits such as the line uh, disarmament, and, disarmament and the Conference on Security and Compa Cooperation in Europe. Washington also gave up the position application of the differential policy um, implemented by Nixon towards Romania and uh, began to use this policy to mark the disagreement with the oppression regime in Bucharest, to use this policy to mark the disagreement. Um, because I my bachelor degree was uh, about uh, uh, historical film and, film and propaganda in communist Romania, I want to make a recommendation. Um, the question is, can movies change the mindset of a population? In a period uh, when Western films were banned in Romania, the black market uh, for American uh, movie were flourishing. Undercover film 
screening gathered multiple families who wa watch uh, foreign movies fascinated by a uh, world that was completely different from theirs. So uh, the movie Chuck Norris versus Communism, who used to double uh, the uh, principal character, who used to double the movies during communist time, takes the question further using it uh, as an argument that uh, movie watching helped lead uh, to the overthrow of the communist regime. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much. This was a very nice uh, survey of um, uh, Romania's uh, foreign policy, uh, in uh, especially in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and again, in the Q&A section, I can make comments or can ask questions as well. But now <clears throat> we have to concentrate on, on that Q&A section itself. Uh, so thank you very much for the presentation. And now the floor is open. Uh, to the audience, first of all, to ask questions. Uh, I will keep my comments at a later stage, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm inviting the the audience to come in and uh, and join the discussion. Of course, uh, the panel members themselves are welcome to uh, ask questions from each other uh, or make comments on on each other's um, presentations. So that's a possibility too. So let me see, and please uh, uh, use the uh, hand raise uh, function. But if you cannot do that for some reason, you just can unmute your microphone and then speak up and say, I have a question and uh, introduce yourselves, please. In that case, let me just see whether we have any, any comments at this moment. Uh, but if not, of course, then I can, and I can. Um, <clears throat> make my comments and questions. Uh, let me see. Oh, Jeff Horn has a question that I'm reminded. So please, Jeff, come in and ask your question. Uh, hello. Yes, thank you all. To all the panelists for uh, presentations were really interesting. Uh, I had a question regarding, um, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, uh, the study of emotions in history. I thought this is a very interesting approach. I long found uh, this, the study of cultural dynamics at different periods of time has been very useful in informing myself kind of what the general mood is that's affecting the public and policymakers in turn. So you can uh, kind of almost see what is the driving catalyst for a lot of the policies that are proposed. So my question to you is, do you feel like the study of emotions complements that? And it's it, it's good to have a uh, study that is comprehensive, considering cultural developments at the time, kind of the, the general zeitgeist, either globally or in specific countries, and then also bringing in this emotional element. Thank you so or much. Are they, or should they be yeah um well i would say that in in terms of the Czechoslovak history uh when i studied uh started studying this topic i was more intrigued by how uh the current Czechoslovak uh so or like the czech republic like society of czech republic and slovakia are dealing with the with the communist past and there is a lot of contested uh histories and expectations and there is a lot of emotional baggage basically uh, left from this period and so that was one thing that studying emotions contextualizing emotions in the past was one of the motivation to actually understand um, not only how the politics work but how how people uh, influence this development as well but um, I, I started working on it just recently and the literature that I read um, was really really interesting and I, I would say that definitely it would uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be just solely a study of emotions, but definitely just the perspective, to, you know, just, just to consider the perspective of emotions in the in analysis of like any historical period or, or any problem, then I think that it definitely can. Um, I, uh, in, I think that it can make historians more empathetic to towards the past and towards what we actually study and uh, not just analyzing facts, but actually trying to understand uh, what was going on, if that's a good answer. <laughs> I hope that answered everything. 
Yes, it is. Sometimes it's hard to remember we're talking about actual people. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that was my point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? Uh, Olga, fine, please go on. Hello. Please uh, uh, unmute your microphone. You okay. Sure, go yes. on. Hello. Thank you for letting me ask the question. Let me ask the question. I well, was at the, uh, in a conference, uh, international conference uh, on. Well, the line is very bad at the moment, so we just can hear some fractions of your speech. Can you fix the line and maybe come back at uh, some minutes later? Well, it's, it's the same again. So I suggest you try to 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 check your connection, and uh, if 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 you have a Wi-Fi, maybe you could turn to a wired uh, connection, yes. because I, usually that makes the problem. Yes, I I switched off the I switched off the the video. Oh, uh, that's all, that's so, a possibility too. Yes, and now now we can hear you at least, and and that's fine. Okay, fine. So just go on so then. Much. Yes, I just wanted to suggest because there was uh, this wonderful um, uh, uh, end of the presentation of the last speaker with uh, the documentary uh, that uh, sort of uh, re not relate but also extends and transcends the topic of his presentation. Um, uh, would it be possible to 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 suggest for the uh, presenters uh, of the today's panel if they would like? Uh, to, to choose also a, a part of the artistic expression from from their from related to the topics and the heroes, the main characters of their presentation, so that we could take them together uh, into a playlist and to add it to the panel, so that when we have the their um, let's say these uh, presentations, because you see some of the presentations could not be fully accompanied by the. PowerPoints, and uh, I have missed some important points on the communist uh, in Italian and Polish uh, presentation. So it would be really great to have also some artistic uh, uh, small sub chapter. And this was my suggestion rather than question because the presentations were amazing. And I just wanted to thank everyone for putting so useful insights uh, to the topic of the panel. And uh, uh, that's it. Sorry if I took a lot of time. OK, thank you very much for the suggestion. Of course, we will we will discuss it uh, with our uh, presenters um, after the conference, because of course we cannot do it right now, but it's a very interesting, a very useful uh, uh, suggestion. So